I'm Janet Dean. I'm Lisa Leamy, and we are your entertainment for the day. <laughs> <laughs> we um, have, you've probably, probably read the brochure, but we have studied for 15 years plus, um, are both qualified therapeutic touch practitioners according to the Therapeutic Touch International Association. And so um, what we would like to share today, and we never know who's gonna be in our audience, so we kind of start with the basics. Mm -hmm. Never hurts to go over basics again, right? Right. I agree. Um, in, a yes. new, in a new way. So um, we'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to divide our information between different sessions. Um, one thing we wanted you to know that if there's any time left over, or even if there isn't, I can stay and we can do some therapeutic touch treatments in the other room on you. They might be a little bit abbreviated because if there's a number, but we could get started today and, and do some of that. How many of you have had therapeutic touch before? Wow. Wow. So are you the only one? No. Mm -hmm. no. Did you raise your hand? I've had Reiki, not therapeutic touch. Okay. Did you raise your hand? Did you say yes or no? Reiki. No. Oh, okay. Okay. He, David has not. Okay. David's in for a surprise. <laughs> so anyway, okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. And I think what we'll do is start with a short meditation just to kind of get everybody, just to kind of get everybody in um, a relaxed and, and um, open place, okay? So both feet on the floor, hands on your lap with palms up if you're comfortable that way. Try to keep your spine straight. And for a minute or so, just, just breathe into being here. So today, let's just say the meditation is all about you. And so we're going to um, go within and we're going to um, allow ourselves to feel more fully um, the functions of our body that we really don't pay too much attention to. And it kind of gives us a little bit of a boost today by giving them our attention. So if we can, we want to quiet our minds a little bit. Just let your thoughts float away if they creep back. Don't try to chase them out. Just allow them to leave again. So starting with senses, you might just notice we're in a new place that maybe has a different scent than where you came from, where you live, or being outside. And if you can pay attention to that scent, see if it may remind you of something, another place, another time. in your mind's eye, because we, we have our eyes closed for the meditation, try to picture some place that is an image of peace for you, a sanctuary, it can be real or make believe, but some place that you can picture yourself being fully open, rested, and healed. that image for the meditation and in that place that you've chosen how does your body feel how do your limbs feel are they tense are they relaxed How about the air that's circulating in the room? Can you feel that on your, on your limbs, on your face? These things are present every day, every moment. 
but in our busy lives, we don't pay attention. And they can teach us things, and they can also <clears throat> bring us from a state of, <clears throat> none of the states we want to be, anger, confusion, uh, rushing to a state of peace, if we can learn to center and ground this way. Now pay attention to your breathing for a minute. And notice and appreciate the fact that we don't have to do anything to make that happen. It's automatic and it's been going on our entire lives and will go on much longer. And we don't think about or have gratitude for that at times. So when you inhale, notice that little silence that little stopping of the breath just before the exhale. And at the end of the exhale, there's also a little gap, a little stopping before the next inhale. And it helps to be able to recognize not just the flow, but that it stops and the appreciation of it starting again all its own. We don't have to help. Feel your feet on the floor, solid ground. This is where we can do our best grounding and centering is when our feet are touching the earth. Granted, <coughs> there are shoes and floors in between right now. Some of you, most of you might know about earthing, meaning going outside and connecting 100% bare feet to solid ground. Can be sand, can be grass, can be water, but connecting to the earth is another way to pull our energy through us and to ground us in a good place. Now, if you just want to take a minute and have some of those concepts run through your mind so that they create the relaxation here today. And if at any time today you feel yourself leaving, concerned, worried, um, wondering about something that's waiting for you after this, just keep your feet on the ground, pay attention to your breath, and allow it to pass for this moment in time. you can take a couple of intentional breaths. Breathe deep. Blow the breath out. And when you're ready, open your eyes and come back. Okay. So we don't know where we need to start because we don't know who our audience is going to be. <laughs> so we kind of start with the basics. And if you're above that, it doesn't hurt to review, right? The world has therapeutic touch going on in one way or another, um, some in very different ways than we do it here. We have a, a very active practitioner, her name is Penina, and she's in Africa. And she, some of her clients walk four or five miles. They don't have cars, you know, can't always ride a giraffe. <laughs> but they walk four or five miles on therapeutic touch day to get their treatment because they're so invested in what it does for them and, and how they can benefit from it. Um, and they bring their children. But a lot of other countries, we've got Israel, Germany, France, a lot of Canada, very big continents mm -hmm. in about 30 plus countries. Very big in Canada almost as big as it is in the United States. So North America is the, the kind of the hub of it. But um, so their definition of therapeutic touch is a holistic evidence-based therapy. This is important, evidence-based. A lot of research too, which Lisa's gonna tell you about 
that incorporates the intentional and compassionate use of universal energy <clears throat> to promote health and well-being and balance. So that's pretty comprehensive. What we want to do is pay attention to three words here. Intentional, compassionate, and universal energy. I think we're all pretty, pretty familiar with universal energy, that nothing moves, nothing grows, nothing changes without it, right? It's, it's the, it's everything, it's everything. And everything you see, universal energy is part of that. You see an airplane in the sky and you think, well, that's got a motor, that's not universal energy. Well, what's it built of? It's built of earth metals, correct? Things that came from the earth, like fossils and, and crystals and other things, have energy, so do the metals. So there's not a thing you can think of, weather, lightning and thunder, rain. You know, every animal, every creature, every amoeba that we see, it's all energy. And that's important to remember. It's also important to remember that we need to protect our energy a little bit in that, I'm not talking about hugging it in and holding it close and don't let anybody near it, but as in taking care of our energy. That's really important. So, these are the two tenets of, I'm gonna move this, Lisa. Sure, can I this bit? These are the two tenets of therapeutic touch, intention and compassion. Therapeutic touch is nothing without intention and compassion. That's what it's built on. So obviously intention is doing something purposely or willfully. Um, so it means wanting to make that move to help. Um, compassionate is seeing a need in someone else and desiring also to move in and help. So you have the compassion that drives it and the intention that solidifies it really. Um, and, and that's what it's built on. Without those two things, it's not therapeutic touch. It might be something, but it's not therapeutic touch. And that's important to remember in the teaching. So um, I've got our body up here. I'm the artist, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, I've got our, our body up here and showing some of the fields. We know there are more. They don't even know how many fields we actually have. But the first one, which is the physical field, we can do therapeutic touch there, that's two inches out. The emotional field is four to six inches out. That's out here. The mental field is eight plus, so we're getting pretty far away from the body. And the spiritual field is 10 and beyond, and, and we don't have evidence, but we believe that the spiritual field goes on, can go on miles, actually especially if you're using you know, meditation or something for that. So it's important to know too, obviously the mind, body, spirit, we all know that term because we've been doing this work and attending these things for a long time. But the fact is that two or one can't do it alone. And almost any situation that you can think of um, that involves your mind, body, or spirit is going to, to make the other two struggle. So. I've got a broken leg, I don't, but for the sake of this, I have a broken leg, so my body is affected. My body is affected, and what's that gonna do to my mind and my spirit? Well, my mind might be thinking about the financial difficulties that I'm gonna have because I can't be walking and working. Um, it might be thinking about transportation issues. It's my right leg, I can't drive. How am I gonna get here, there, and everywhere? So the body, affected the mind. The mind, you might be going through a spiritual crisis. So you have a belief system and something comes along to interrupt that belief system. Or you have a tragedy and you don't understand why bad things happen to good people, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's your spirit that gets affected before you know it. I've got stomach aches all the time, or I've got migraines all the time, right? There's, there's no two ways around it. And the same thing with the mind. You know, something's happening. Um, maybe you've got a critical problem you're thinking out about before you know it, the other two are starting to react to that. So the spirit has to be included in the mind and body. It's not what we're taught. It's not what we're taught in the United States or in the world. We're taught that there's a medicine for that and there's a, you know, things to do um, that, that aren't something you can do for yourself. You need a team for that. Um, and so we have to look beyond. I think probably all of us, if we're here, we've done that before. 
that we look to ourselves or beyond to heal ourselves. But this is this is so important. This is so critical. And um, we do need a team. And again, sorry about the hard work, but um, Therapeutic Touch is a healing team. It's a healing team because the practitioner does not heal you. There are healers in the world. Not all Therapeutic Touch practitioners are those healers. But if we can nudge your body, sort of say to it, remember, remember that you have this innate wisdom that you can do it yourself. People forget. I've been in health crises myself where all this goes out the window because what are you thinking about, right? You're thinking about this and how it's going to impact everything else and might be making you sad or depressed or some of those other kind of things. And so if we can remember and if we can help you remember that you know how to do it, you've forgotten or maybe you got off track, train went this way and you went this way, that it's really an important concept that you remember that you can do it. Um, so the healing partners are obviously a practitioner and the person that they're, that they're working with and, and starting to help heal. Um, and it takes all of what we just talked about, the mind, body, and spirit to do that. So whether no matter where it is on that circle of wholeness, therapy of touch can touch that because we're reaching in here. And while I'm over here, remember that that energy field that we have and by the way, I put heart energy up here because the heart energy goes way further than that on scans and, and, and different things. They've been able to tell that at least three feet up, probably a lot farther, 360 degrees around. Heart math. That would be heart math. Heart math. Yes. That's uh -huh. right. Yeah, that's right, Mark. Um, <clears throat> that, that that can be felt and utilized. It can be utilized. You can send that out. Um, we'll talk about distance TT, but you send it out a lot further than that because we do it too. Um, so that's important to know. But if I walk up to, to Mark to shake his hand, hi, how you doing, Mark? I'm already in what fields? I'm already in all those fields, right? Don't go away. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> yeah, sweet. Yeah, so, um, I'm in all those fields. So another thing we don't pay attention to, because nobody told us, nobody taught us, is that um, you can help or hurt in those fields, right? So I'm in a really good mood. I go into Jewel on my way home. I've had a great day. <laughs> I'm getting ready to pay for my, whatever, my yogurt. And I'm standing there, and this mood is just dissipating and melting and moving away. And I'm starting to feel irritated, and I'm starting to feel um, a little cranky, impatient, maybe. Took me a long time to figure this out, and it was before therapeutic touch, but who's in front of me, and what's he doing? This guy's tapping his foot, he's banging his thing on the table, he's singing under his breath, you know, that kind of thing. I can't see you, David. And, um, and so, I'm in his fields. You know, whatever the spiritual field is, it's not doing me any good because I'm in his mental field and I can feel all of that. Turn it around though. I come in and I'm the one, I had a car accident this morning and then I got a call that my granddaughter was sick and I walk in there, I just wanna go home. And there's somebody in front of me that turns around and smiles. How are you? And all of a sudden, what happens? Your day starts to pick up, right? You can feel it, you can feel that energy from other people. And so we don't want to be the guy that's tapping and, and grumbling. It's important to remember that when you're close to people. I had a dream about five years ago, and I was on a park bench, I think, somewhere, and I was just walking, watching people walk by with their dogs and other people. And I could see their auras. And I, I have been able to see auras sometimes, not always. But, you know, here's an a unusual color of blue, and there's somebody coming this way and it's unusual color of orange, and as they pass each other, like you and I just passed in each other's um, field, um, this sort of explosion of new color, colors that I haven't even seen before, happened. Mm -hmm. And they just walked past each other, but they touched each other's field. So it was a good example to me, and I watched that happen over and over and over again, 
that as we greet each other, or not, even not greet, we're just walking and passing other people, that our auras are enhanced in a really beautiful way by, by that passing and by that holding hands and all the other things. It's really interesting. So, um, let's see. Probably all of you have done this, but for the sake of having fun and involving you, um, have you ever felt your own, your own energy? Mm -hmm. Everybody know how to feel? <laughs> do you mind doing it again? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is simple, simple exercise, but it's fun. And if you practice it, you can not only get better at feeling your own energy, but you can get better at feeling somebody else's energy. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold our two hands, maybe three inches apart. Close your eyes if it helps, but watch what I'm going to do first, okay? We're just going to kind of bounce them together a little bit. Just don't pay attention with your eyes. Close your eyes maybe now that you know what to do. And just move them back and forth. And you'll begin to feel, maybe not immediately, you'll begin to feel a little bit of resistance in between there. Like almost like there's a small pillow or a cotton candy, something that's soft and that's sort of pushing them away as they come closer together. Okay, now go a little further out. Go four inches out. Do the same thing and see if you can still feel that matter, that energy that's in between there. Sometimes it's easier here than it was closer together. Maybe, maybe it feels like a balloon. Um, and just do that. Let me just ask right now, is everybody getting a sensation of something being there mm -hmm. a little bit? Okay, go out a foot or a foot and a half <clears throat> and do it again. Depending how far your personal energy field goes out, you may still be able to feel it. I usually lose it at about this place, but you may be able to feel it. If you're feeling exuberant, it's probably out that far. Okay, go out a little bit more. So we're two and a half, three feet apart. This far apart, you're not likely to feel anything. That feeling of light resistance isn't there anymore. It's just kind of disappeared. But if you bring your hands close together again, you can feel that sensation of something being between them. We'll go a little bit further with that. So spread your fingers out wide. And what we're going to do is about three or four inches apart is just Rotate your hands in different directions slowly. Just turn them without moving them, David. Like, see how I'm just turning like a cog, cog wheel? Just do it for a minute. Concentrate on it. Close your eyes if you need to. And what you can begin to feel is there's an energy in a space, an energy in a space, energy in a space. You begin to feel the gap, almost like Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Energy, blank, energy, blank, energy, blank. So that's another way of doing it, okay? So if you play with that, it's really good. In Therapeutic Touch, we do an exercise when we're training other healers, and it's called uh, Butterfly Tiger. So if I were working with you, Mark, you would decide, are you going to send me butterfly energy or tiger energy? And in your head, say you pick tiger. Well, I'm into tiger. Oh, there you yeah, go. Tiger, okay. Like, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so what you uh -huh. would do is we would put our hands up, not touching, just uh -huh. the energy field there, and you would send whatever a tiger means to you. So likely, right. roaring. Yeah, and yes. you don't want to show it because I'm gonna have to guess what you're sending. Okay. So you're like this, and you're sending. Let's just say you're sending tiger. It's very different than butterfly energy, isn't it? Butterfly energy is very light and lilting and soft and quiet. So as practitioners, we do that. And then we have to say, I think you were sending me butterfly energy because it felt soft and gentle. And very often we're right. Isn't that right, Sandy? Yeah, very often we're right when you've had the practice. So if you have somebody that you can do that with, it's kind of fun to, to practice your own energy and get a little better feel for for ourselves and, and for others. Okay, I'll just add one thing. Please do. Another thing you can do, um, just while on your own, is you could designate one hand maybe being sad and one hand being happy. 
you know, you have to designate in your mind. You might think of it as a situation or something like that, or maybe a person, <laughs> whatever. And then you allow yourself, so say this is my um, sad hand and this is my happy hand and I've designated it. Now I'm gonna to wanna to start to feel what is the difference between this hand and that hand. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when you're working with groups, the response you get is, oh my goodness, like this hand felt so much lighter, I could feel, or I got a color, I, I, I felt pink. And then the heavier hand, whatever you designate, um, is you know somebody could feel I see black or it just felt so sad and my hand felt heavy so we're going to feel different feelings from different emotions mm -hmm. and it's just a little uh, it's to just tell you how good you are and how much you already know so yeah nice thank fun you little practice. Yes. Yeah. you're Sam right yeah this is Sam she walked Hi. in a few minutes late but that's okay <laughs> I told her she could I did <laughs> Sam is an acupuncturist and this could come in very handy oh, for you too as well, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. How how would you use that? Would it be approaching somebody or I don't mean to put um, you on the spot. <laughs> um probably just give me an overall uh sense of how they are at the moment, you know, yeah. during in, you know my consultations with them. Right. Um, I get a sense of, you know, their overall energy and mm -hmm. you know, along with what they're telling me. So mm -hmm. it helps. Mm -hmm. It gives me a little bit more good. information. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, because we're talking about healing, we're also talking about illness or deficits or, or different things like that. And I think the questions that come up sometimes are, um, why did this happen? Uh, something could be temporary. I sprained my ankle or it could be permanent. I have diabetes or or something that's that's going to be an ongoing problem so some of the first of all let me tell you about my I have a brother-in-law in New Jersey and his occupation is he's a um, personal trainer if I told you some of the names of the people he worked on in New York and New Jersey you wouldn't believe it and has gone on vacation movie stars and sports figures and things like that and he did that for about 20 probably close to 30 years and he was diagnosed with MS. He still does it to the capability that he can, um, extremely restricted because he has a bad limp, he needs a cane, you know, all life has changed for him. And I saw a video that he did for one of the sports companies actually. And in the video, this is his take on it, this doesn't need to be our take on it, but I thought it was interesting. He said, I don't blame myself, but I realize that I did this to myself. He said, I didn't honor my body. I didn't take care of my body. Now he's a trainer, so he's telling other people to do it, but we don't do it. Sometimes we don't do it ourselves. And in younger years, I abused my body, and I think that this happened. And I know not only have to live with that, I'm going to live with it because my, this is where my path led me. So it's a spiritual take. Um, he's not sad about it. I don't know how he moved through so quickly. He's, he's pretty, um, he's a unique human being to begin with. So his path with MS is um, not such a problem. Might look at it watching him. But anyway, so why did this illness appear? When I was publishing my book in 2015, I was also working 60 hours a week as a hospice nurse. And I had time for nothing. I had time to eat right. I didn't, I didn't have time to do anything. And here I had to get ready for a talk that was much bigger than this. And I knew I wasn't going to have time. I was frazzling myself even thinking about how am I going to carry this off. Well, I was at Therapeutic Touch one night. I don't think you were there. You were there. And I went to kneel down and I tore my quadriceps. Oh, yeah. Just kneeling down. In Very fact, bad. it felt like, I mean, it sounded like a what? washcloth being ripped and everybody turned around and said what was that well guess what for the next two weeks I had plenty of time <laughs> to do my to do my speech and prepare and everything had to go in there with this big gimping thing on my leg you know but um did I bring that in did I say let's all, let something happen so that I can be home and feel prepared for this I don't know we don't always know but be careful what you wish sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Careful what you wish. Um, so another question is, do 
does someone want to heal? Do I want to heal? Um, as a nurse for 30 years, and I know Lisa and Sandy too as a nurse, any other nurses in here? No. Um, would agree with this. There are some people that don't want to heal because there are certain things that it brings to them, okay? Um, it may be your family would not be hovering around and helping and you wouldn't be feeling the love if you weren't, didn't need their help. Um, there are people that actually enjoy um, medical attention from doctors. There's a name for that. <laughs> There's a name for that. Um, Munchausen, but not even to that extent. But some people love to see the doctor and get a new prescription and go home and you know say I say I'm being cared for. It can relieve us from our responsibilities sometimes if I if I can't work. I think they're few and far between, but some people do not want to heal. When I have somebody sit in my chair for therapeutic touch and their arms go across their body and they say, I don't believe in this. You can do it. You could do it if you want to, but I don't believe that you know energy medicine works. Do you know what they're going to get out of it? Nothing. Even if I explain that to them, that this is it's important that you lend yourself to this, um, nothing or the one that sits there and chats the whole time even though they've been told, we can communicate, but let's not have this ongoing really loud thing going on because that's breaking my concentration to help you and it's breaking your concentration to help yourself. Um, some people don't want to heal. And we have to respect that about everybody that we work with, right? Whether you're a doctor, nurse, dentist, therapist, whatever it is, we have to respect that they have drawn a line in the sand. And even though they might seek it, they're not going to follow. So just, okay, is the illness a challenge to overcome? It usually is, but is that why it's in your path? You know, has your life maybe been too easy and you need something to put the spark back in it for you? It happens sometimes. Um, is it to teach us to cope? That's what I think mine was when it happened to my leg at that time was um, I didn't need to be, I had a lot of thinking time. I didn't need to be doing what I was doing, which was killing myself trying to take care of everybody else, right? Um, is it a challenge to adapt to something new? My brother-in-law, John, you know, he's met the challenge as far as I'm concerned because he's there. He's like, I'm not, you know, stamping my feet and swearing at people. This is, this is going to be my life from now on. Honorable, really honorable. Um, is it part of our soul path to experience an illness or an injury, especially something that's going to be permanent and change our lives. That happens too. We have lessons all the way along. Some of it is losing your money. Some of it is losing uh, somebody very close to you. Um, it could be losing part of our health, right? So if it's permanent, we might think or cope with it better by saying, what do I need to learn from this, okay? Um, acceptance of things I can't change, you know, all those things. Um, so anyway, I think, Lisa, I'm going to, well, let me just go a little bit further. And okay. Then, and then you can do your, your um, what you want to do next. So what can therapeutic touch do? First of all, just like doctors and nurses take their oath, do no harm. Do no harm. Which means, and we're going to talk more about grounding and centering, before I walk up to you, I need to make sure I've left everything on the shelf. I can't come to you with what happened to me in my day and a fight I had on the phone and, you know, dog pooped in the house, whatever it is. Yeah. So if someone uh, has a reason that they don't want to heal and mm -hmm. it's, it's mental or emotional, mm -hmm. but they've gotten themselves. So obviously they walked in the door for their mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. You might say, well, um, I'm aware that there's something going on where you're, mm -hmm. you, you might say something like that. Mm -hmm. And could you ask them, would you be open to me working on your mental emotional field? Mm -hmm. And let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. is, is that a possibility? Because, because obviously they walked in the door. They walked in the door. Yeah, they walked in the door. You can also encourage them because their good touch is cumulative. So one session is good. Two is better, three is way better, especially with chronic things that come up. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about um, uh, new patterns and old patterns that are set 
being stung. I haven't, everybody has it probably. Um, in, in my experience, um, it doesn't help much to change their mind. You can put it out there, you can ask them to come back and have further treatments, you can ask them to divulge or tell you a little bit more about what's going on in their life so at least you have a focus. Um, but I think people that are set against healing, unless something really turns their head around, that they're just not interested. Yeah. I guess what I'm asking though is actually working with the therapeutic touch mm -hmm. on that, whatever that mental, emotional, because maybe it's linked to a trauma yeah. where they don't trust people, or, or is that? That's why we're talking about old patterns and new patterns, ah, like okay. something that goes way back, will they let you get at it? Maybe, go ahead. So this, I, that's a great question. Um, I was at Mary and Joy for 15 years, and most people were very accepting and were really open. But I had several occasions or many that people were kind of like that person, you know, with their arms crossed. But I have to touch, share this because you never know what the power of our heart and passion can do for somebody. Because they may still have a, you know, an unhappy face and their, their physical body may still be tight. But you don't know. So that's when we let it go, right? We have to, you know, say we did what we could and however it worked. So this woman who had something like ALS, but that wasn't the, the diagnosis, but she was very debilitated, very angry, and she came in basically in a wheelchair, and you know, you can't help me, I'm in so much pain, you know, you know, and I did, you know, talk to her, I did everything that was appropriate that, to help her. So we had this, you know, session, we continued, she allowed therapeutic touch, and her field was pretty, <laughs> couldn't feel too much, but you know, you go through the steps, you have your heart open, and you try to entrain yourself with them because that's how the higher frequency, the dominant um, energy in the room is the higher frequency. So that's what we have. And we want to entrain that to that person who perhaps is a lower frequency. So I said goodbye. She seemed kind of angry. <laughs> and I never thought I'd see her again. I didn't reschedule her. The next two days later, she's on my schedule. And I'm like, whoa, I couldn't believe it. So I'm like, great. So she came up. Or she, she was in her wheelchair, and she said, I just want to apologize to you. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, she said, every day of my life, I feel like I'm in a sewer, mm -hmm. and I'm looking up, and I can't get out of the sewer. And she said, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but she said, the next day afterwards, she said, I wasn't in the sewer anymore. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This gives me the chills. And she mm -hmm. said, I wasn't looking from the sewer, I was. And so then I got to see her more often. And again, it's not in my hands, you know. We use our hands because our hands are connected to our heart. So, mm -hmm. you know, some practice. folks um, that um, are desperate, medical doctors aren't helping them, and they, they don't believe in the energy shit at all. I mean, mm -hmm. but uh, they're desperate, so I'm going to try it. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, they become believers. Because yes. The healer is well, yes. very good, mm -hmm. and they just they change the whole world. Mm -hmm. I, can't, yeah. I can't believe it. Despite, yeah. despite the right. fact that she had fear about it, right. she was ready to heal. Right. If somebody's not ready, there's not very much you can do. You can keep trying. And remember that part of that is um, you, you have a responsibility to it to yourself to heal, even if it's just to modify a condition. Maybe it's not going to go away. Maybe it's there forever but that it can be modified. So your responsibility, or, or if that was me in that case, would be not only to accept the nudge that somebody gave me to start the healing, but to do what I could think of to do to continue the healing, and perhaps coming back and getting those nudges over and over so that that brain connection, instead of going to the medical doctors with the pills and the, and the scans, starts to go toward what else could I seek out that might help me um, in, in some way to, to either live with it, modify it and make it better, or maybe have it disappear entirely. Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you have to want it. And if you don't want it, no judgment there. There are reasons for not wanting it. Um, so anyway, whether therapeutic touch heals, takes away something or not, um, what can it do? The very first thing it does, and does every single time, 
and we see it while we're doing the, the um, session, is the relaxation response. Well, that's good. You might think that's good. No, that's the beginning of be being able to heal. Because when your body is in the relaxed state, that's when it can heal you again and it can heal. It can't heal when it's like this. Can't heal when it's in pain. Can't heal when all this stuff is going up, you know, around up there and you're, you're losing your faith because life has changed and things like that. No, the relaxation response, and the way we see it is, and it happens within one to two minutes every time, is we start to do those rotations around you, and we're going to do a demo, and then we'll, we'll, we'll help you in the other room, is that, um, is that we see this. Within one to two minutes. I don't think I've ever not seen it. And so your body's already saying, okay, I accept this. And it's in a state where you're not pushing against it, you're not fearing it, and, and you're able to accept it. So if that's all that happens, that's a huge gift. That's when your body heals. That's when you get a good night's sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So it can still, uh, let's say I have MS, like, like my brother-in-law was talking about. It can still boost your energy level despite the MS. It can increase circulation, which would help MS or anything. Decrease muscle and joint pain. Pain can be perceived pain. Do you know what I mean by perceived pain? Um, let's say um, I'm losing my job next week and I've never had stomach problems, but all of a sudden in the afternoon I'm starting to get these pains in my stomach. This is transferring to there. There's nothing really wrong with my stomach, but I'm feeling it there. So that's perceived pain. It's probably more anxiety, tension, whatever it is, um, but it can help muscle and joint pain, perceived or real, uh, boost your immune system, who can't use that, increase digestion, decrease stress and anxiety, anxiety, again, like the relaxation response, that's when you can start to heal yourself, um, enhances well-being, promotes restorative sleep, um, enhances non-physical functions of the heart. So when we talk about compassion and sympathy, and empathy, being able to understand what somebody is going through and, and wishing to help, those are really important things to, to carry with us, and it also protects us. Um, ease the dying process. Like I said, it was a hospice nurse, mm -hmm. and there's something very spe specific called the heart can connection that um, we do with the dying. Why don't you come here just for a minute, mm -hmm. Lisa? Yeah. So if I take Lisa's left hand in mind, the shortest circuit throughout this whole electrical being that we are, the shortest circuit is down my arm, from my heart, down my arm, up her arm to her heart. It doesn't have to go anywhere else. And so there's something specific we do in the dying process where we move that energy the shortest, quickest way and very powerful way. That works yeah, for you, I have doesn't that. it? Yeah. yeah, good, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's important too. So those are the things I, yeah, before we get into anything else, why don't you come up and I'll sit down. Okay. okay. All right, I'm going to talk um, a little bit. I'm going to take what Janet talked about, the relaxation response. I'm going to go off on that for a little bit. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the history of Dora and Dee. Some of you may know. And then uh, the research, there's uh, plenty of research. I'll just highlight a few things, okay? So um, I'm going to ask you a question. How does stress feel in your body? Anybody want to share I would, first of all, congratulations that you've made it over the last almost three years. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You have survived something that uh, probably mm -hmm. in history has never, and we've never experienced an event quite like we've made it through. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to each and every one of you. I'm sure you did a lot of good things, and certainly I, uh, I've had a lot of... I'm, we're here now, I think, because of all that uh, that happened over the last couple of years. So it opened a lot of doors for us. So how does stress feel in your body? Anybody want to share? Gnawing in the stomach. Okay. Okay, so Janet mentioned that. Anybody else? Yeah? Just tense. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, you know how it feels. <laughs> and shoulders, uh -huh. muscles. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Lack of appetite. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right. So it's pretty powerful. It's pretty overwhelming. So Janet talks about TT and the stress response. And when we first start working with our um, partner, so we're not calling people patients, we're calling us partners. 
and we're, you know, we ask if we can touch, some people prefer not to be touched, but we start by kind of lightly rubbing the shoulders and the neck. So, <laughs> our body with the nervous system, so we have our brain and our spinal cord that runs down, and there's a wonderful nerve called the vagus nerve. Okay, anybody hear the vagus nerve? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a lot of medical doctors <coughs> could not talk about the vagus nerve. So, when we get to the neck and shoulders, this is kind of a little bit of a diagram that's been around for a very long time. We have all these networks of nerves. So I have 100, approximately 100 billion nerves in my brain. We have approximately 70 to 100 trillion cells in our body. That's the dense part of us that's all connected by this brain and spinal cord that then has branches out to all of our hormones. So these seven sections, nexuses of nerves we have in our body are magically somehow connected to the chakra system. So these are the energy wheels that come out and communicate out in, in and out of our field. So it's so beautiful how our body is designed, the, the intelligence. So when we're working on the shoulders, right, we're very close to the neck. So where the, the nexus in the neck connects to the vagus nerves because the vagus nerve runs a little bit in here and then obviously down to the heart. So it connects to all of our organs. There's a question whether it connects to the spleen. Most people say no, but some people say yes. So I don't wanna get into that, but it connects to all of our organ systems. So when we're in stress, any questions? There's, where, where does the vagus nerve start? This starts in the midbrain. Okay, so kind of in this area here, um, kind of like maybe third eye right in here, and then it branches off and then it comes back to the spinal cord and it goes all the way down. So it's called the wandering nerve or the healing nerve. So when we're in a stress response, we're in fight, flight, freeze, or faint. Those are the four main things that happen. Anybody ever do any of that? <laughs> yes, okay. So when we're in that response, the part of our brain is connected to, it's called the amygdala, that's the emotional brain, gets activated, right? Because it has to communicate our body from the field is stressed out. The, the physical field is in, taking that information, saying, okay, I need this, and I need these hormones and chemicals so I can get through my, um, the tiger. I can fight the tiger, run away from the tiger. So we're gonna have adrenaline and cortisol, right? It's gonna course through our body so we can run, we can save our lives, we can lift a car off of uh, somebody, right? That's that amazing amount of energy that we get in order to survive. And we've all been there, we know what it feels like. When it does its job and we're, we've made it through, all that is supposed to go down. But it doesn't because over time, and if we keep repeating things over and over, we are gonna pattern ourselves to be constantly or almost always in a state. So our norm, or our, yeah, our norm is high stress, and that's how the last couple of years have been fairly collectively and individually. So we're getting, uh, we're getting in that um, uh, sympathetic response, our body cannot heal, it's surviving, period. It has to survive because it's only creating certain chemicals and hormones that are meant to help us run, fight, flight, freeze, or faint. So that's why for therapeutic touch, how simply and beautifully we can just be the the higher frequency and train to our partner. What well, it's not all it's all very you know, our conscious field is communicating the consciousness, and then allow that person to come down out of that stress response because they're gonna feel start to feel it. And like Janet said, the system that heals is the parasympathetic system, and that's rest, digest, tend, and befriend. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, how often do we do that? Mm -hmm. Right? Only in that system, when we're in parasympathetic, can our body do what it needs to do to heal. Whether it's therapeutic touch or it doesn't matter, right? Acupuncture, mm -hmm. that's what you're looking for. You're looking yeah. for creating those changes in the, in the nervous system. So, so that's why it's so important that that person who's receiving whatever they're receiving is getting into that parasympathetic response. So their body can rest, digest, tend to be front, and heal. So that vagus nerve, and so it's strengthening the vagus nerve. 
therapeutic touch, acupuncture, music, all kinds of things strengthen Reiki. the vagus nerve. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. You're an excellent teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'll just pass this um, <laughs> just so you can just sort of take a look at it. And then, of course, there's colors and all that, which is more information, but I'm sure you're aware of that. And then this was something that was really, um, we used this and just about the heart field, and we do have more of these, not today. Um, the heart actually starts to, the heart develops before the brain. And our heart field, as Janet we always already referred to, is the stronger than our brain. So electric, electrically and magnetically, our field is um, me um, measurably stronger than our brain. So well, who do we like being with, somebody with a big heart? Or a big brain, like who's more fun to be with? Oh well, I know who I want to be with. So, but this is just some notes. It's the human's heart magnetic field can be can be measured several feet away. So that's why when you come into a place like Lightheart Center, and you know, think of the name. I already feel good. I, I drive up and I already feel good because that's what this place represents. And obviously, Renee and Ryan created this many many years ago, and they, you know. This is, mm -hmm. you're here all the time, <laughs> whether you are or not. Negative emotions can create a system of chaos, but positive emotions do the opposite. So that goes back to the brain. What emotion are we feeling in the amygdala? Are we happy or are we sad? That's going to represent in our body then, right, what exactly is going on. So joyful emotions, high frequency love is going to look different than the other, the lower frequency emotions. So we want to do our best, you know, we're, nothing's ever perfect. Positive emotions increases the brain's ability to make good decisions. So when we're in overwhelm, like we've been for the last couple years, people cannot make a decision at all. It's very, very difficult. There's so much going on up here that that's the freeze part. The freeze or faint. I can't make a decision because it's just too much. So that's how um, animals, play dead when they're trying to survive. That's their version of it. So that's, you know, they're pretty smart too. You can boost your immune system. Janet talked about that by focusing on positive emotions. Positive emotions create physical, physiological benefits in your body. And in field development, the heart is before the brain. So you see this is like a holographic representation of how powerful our heart field can be. So pretty cool. Um, any questions? So, Dora and Dee, some of you have been to the TS. You said you have been. And who else? We certainly have, some of us. So, was anybody there when Dora was, um, uh, she's going to grab this book. The creator was there when she was, yes, yes, some of you were there. So, what happened 50 years ago, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary, there was a woman named Dora Kuntz, Dora Van Gelder Kuntz. And this is one of her many books, but this is one of my favorites just to bring. And Jan talked about auras that she could see. So Dora was born in the Dutch West Indies. Um, she would have been in her hundreds by now, I think, early hundreds. Um, she passed away quite a few years ago. In 2010, maybe? I think it was 2010. And Dee just passed away last year. So Dora could see auras, but she could see a lot more. She came from a family of intuitives. And so as a little girl, she could go and see somebody and say, oh my goodness, that person's sick, they have cancer. And it was really, really nurtured because her mom and her aunt and her family all knew how to, to support her with that knowledge that she was able to see people's auras. So here she was. This, a lot of people can, but they don't know what to do with the information, so they shut it down. But Dora, luckily, where she came from and was that support nurture. So as she grew up, obviously all of her intuition became very activated and strong, right? Because she had the ability to see, clairvoyant. So she could see and she had other, other clairvoyant abilities. But she could see the human aura and the human field. And she could tell if it was dysrhythmic, out of balance, disordered, is there a disease going on, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical. So then she moves to New York City and she meets a young woman in a meditation class. So if it's been 50 years since Therapeutic Touch was created, this was prior to that. 
And there was this big movement of meditation, right? Along oh, several years ago, and that transcendental meditation. So they meet this young woman who's going to be a nurse. They become friends, and they apparently supported D. She, the decreer, she went to nursing school, she becomes a nurse. So their friendship continued. But what happened is at New York University, so Therapeutic Touch was birthed out of a medical institution, which is really, really kind of contrary. But she would, um, the doctors would say, we don't know what you're doing, but keep on doing it. So she could literally not, she wouldn't even have to see a person, but she could focus on their name or focus on something, you know, a, a chart, and she would be able to um, read their energy field. So that's a really powerful woman right there. So her and Dee decided, we can teach people how to do this. We can teach other, pe other people that they also have the ability. You don't have to have a high ability like, like Dora, but you can, we can all do it. And so they had nursing school there. There was about the nurses. So that's why there are a lot of nurses in therapeutic touch because we kind of came from that belief system and we've been taught by many, but it, you don't have to be. We're maybe about 60% nurses now. So there's more and more people coming from other um, areas and other, you know, all kinds of branches of healthcare too. So um, when they got together and what they did is as they were learning and trying to figure out, you know, how are we gonna see the field and where we start in the back and the front, there's a very specific way we do it. They had a, a clairvoyant gentleman named Estebani. He was very, very um, um, uh, uh, well known at that time. And he would watch them do their treatments or their sessions. And then he would watch what the field was doing with his clairvoyant abilities. So he could see the changes in the auras of their clients or themselves, however they were doing it. So that's, it, it took a lot of time and a lot of research. Um, and then once they created it, who did they work with? They worked with nurses. And they went to a place called Pumpkin Hell. And it branched off into um, Orcas Island. So a lot of came through the TS, because then Dora went over to the TS at one point. And she was, um, how long was she at the TS? Like t over 10 years, maybe? Do you remember how long? She was there, yeah. For a while. So um, anyway, that's a really good, so we just celebrated 50 years of therapeutic touch. And Dee Krieger was also, when they, uh, the cameras, when they first, when they were able to photograph the field, um, the Carillion camera, the Carillion photography, that's now so advanced. Um, she was like the first hand, <laughs> so they took a picture of her hand and there's this beautiful aura, you know, coming out from her hand. So that was, that was pretty cool. Has anybody had their aura pictures taken? Yeah. Yeah, and it's constantly changing, mm -hmm. right? It's pretty interesting, um, but you want to go to, a, obviously, a good person. So, any questions? Okay. And so, as far as research, um, like as Janet talked about, um, I've got, like, this, right? It's lots and lots of research. But it's really important for a therapeutic touch and for... Um, the people that are working and the, the, the um, practitioners to be able to say that we actually have evidence because a lot of people really need that. That helps them, you know, and we know obviously acupuncture has a tremendous amount, thousands of years. You know, we're not really um, alternative healing. This is original healing. The alternative is something else. But we won't tell them right yet. They'll find out eventually. So, yes. Just a comment, Lisa. Uh, when I went to China and we did Qigong oh, uh, right. healing, it was exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it, it was very interesting to me that, you know, it was like they sent it the same way. They would send it across the room. They would work with patients in the hospitals. But it was called Qigong healing. Yes. But yes. all... All pretty much off the body, but sometimes way off the body. Um, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Like the one I took in the Spring Forest, you come at the time. Uh, very that different was... than what I did okay. at. Um, it, we did distance healing too, of course. Yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. Okay, um, we'll draw the energy from the uh, Mother Earth, mm -hmm. and then uh, Reiki and Tesdo from the Crown Chakra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just well, mm -hmm. there's many sources all around, mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm, yeah. I think yeah, a lot of people uh -huh. did variations of, uh -huh. you know, the same, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. what it what it showed us is that 
it's 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 universal mm -hmm. and and different people and Oscar actually uh, I don't know if you remember this uh, uh, Dora actually heard about Oscar Estebani because he was working with horses oh that's right and that's right and that's they, uh, Dolores and Dora went to see what he was doing and he was actually working on body with the horses. Mm -hmm. And then they felt that because of going into the hospital, they needed to work off body and it was fine mm -hmm. and stuff. But yeah. that was, that was a, yeah. a neat thing. And he was, he was noted for his healing horses. Yeah. So that's, that's right. why they went to see him. Right, stuff, but, right, right, right. But right. quite yeah. a journey, right? It's just so beautiful. It's yeah. just no, so, so beautiful. So some of the things that um, the evidence base has shown, and there's tons and tons of information, is um, it's worked with addictions, and uh, anxiety scores were significantly less on days one, two, and three for the group receiving therapeutic touch. Um, no significant finally, find, findings related to withdrawal symptoms. Um, but it was obviously very, very, um, you know, very beneficial. Alzheimer's and dementia, they've done work with that. Um, the potential of TT in dealing with agitated behaviors by people with dementia is, you know, very, was very helpful. Um, it's an important intervention and it's not costly. So that's another thing about TT. It's, you know, pretty, pretty <coughs> inexpensive. But the thing, yes. I'd just like to say that we had a very devoted um, therapeutic touch, uh, a man that was with our group for quite a while, and he was a carpenter by trade, so not really into healing energy, but his mom had Alzheimer's, and he, he was involved deeply with her care, and um, he came to the group for a year and a half, would you say? Year yeah, and a half at yeah. least, yeah. Um, to learn how to do it so that he could offer something to her, and coming back, we know it as nurses, but... Even a person in the trades that doesn't have, you know, medical learning experience, he would just come back and tell us these beautiful stories about how staff couldn't calm her, um, couldn't get her to stop repetitive speech, you know, and things like that, but that he would do therapeutic touch on her and, mm -hmm. um, and those things could be controlled for the moment or for the hour or for the evening. And I thought that was such a beautiful example. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, every time I had a patient, every time she stuttered, and she had a lot of neurological problems, very, very severe, very complicated. She stopped stuttering probably for several hours after therapeutic touch. It mm -hmm. didn't continue. Like I would see her another day and she would stutter again, but then we'd do therapeutic touch and she, so she, she would go, she would go, do, 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 door. that would be how what she would say. And then when it was over, she'd go, door, window. Aww. And it was like, it was like, I oh, got the chills just thinking about her now, but it was really, really cool. So who knows what, you know, prolonged, what more could be done. Um, cancer care, elder care, um, medical procedures, pain management, post-surgery, pre-surgery, infants. Um, also, cancer. We actually got to meet Gloria Bronowitz. This is a woman who did some amazing work with cancer. Um, and there was one that... Therapeutic touch has significant effects on um, breast cancer, metastasis, and immune responses. So what it did was it helped. Um, there, it wasn't that the cancer completely went away, but there was no further metastasis. There was also something with bones. Um, uh, as far as bone breakages, oh, I don't know where I just put that. Uh, oh, yeah, the osteoblast prol proliferation and bone formation. So it actually increased that when people had a break or some type of an injury or surgery, it increases wound healing. So again, look at, we've created that relaxation response in the body. And so now the body is doing, is able to do what the divine wisdom and intelligence of our body is here to do, what we can do. But we can't heal without it being under the right guidance, the right support, the, the right intention, right? Because, you know, we all been, you know, had tried different things that don't work. So, anyway, that's Great. it for us. Yeah, yeah, okay. Great. We're going to get started on our demo in a minute, but I wanted, a couple things came into my head that weren't in my notes. And one is, can you do therapeutic touch on yourself? Yes, you can. But obviously, you can't reach your whole energy field. You would turn into a pretzel doing it. But let's say I get a deep, uh, warm scratch on my arm from gardening. 
um, I can definitely do therapeutic touch on something like that. Okay, we don't spend a lot of time on the head for multiple reasons, but if I have a headache, I might do with intention and compassion a few swipes over my head. Um, it can be done on babies, and we can talk more about that another time, but it would be one hand for infants and only a few passes over them because you don't want to use adult energy on a small body, right? Anybody that has pets, you can practice on your pets. Yeah. Sandy's been at my house um, to do therapeutic touch on me, and I have a dog named Elska, a bigger dog. And uh, she might be laying over there when we start, but boy, she comes, she mm -hmm. feels it, she senses yeah. it, she comes over, she tries to get in that energy field. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. oh, she was so cute with that. Do it on your plants, too. Every, well, that's what I was just going to oh, say. Oh, yeah. okay, sorry. <laughs> so, so some people, some people that are still trying to get, uh, maybe they don't live with someone else in the house or a pet, but they do it on their plants. Um, in an experiment form, I'm not going to treat you, but I'm going to treat you. Sorry about you, but mm -hmm. um, and they notice the difference between um, mm -hmm. how fast it grows, how green it is, you know, whether the root system is the same. So any living thing it can be used as. And the other thing I wanted to bring up was we we talked about chakras a little bit, but the stance that Therapeutic Touch International has on the chakras, we don't work with your chakras. Right. We know they're there. Mm -hmm. But our belief is that if we get the body working right, the chakras will do what they need to do. My, my personal feeling is your chakras are doing what they're doing because of where you're at physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and that those will change, shift, reverse, whatever they need to do as your growth comes or as, as your experience comes. Um, so we don't ignore them, but we don't do anything we to, don't man manipulate, to manipulate we them. We don't right. consciously manipulate open and close. It's on, yeah. your, it's mm -hmm. on your end mm -hmm. if it opens or closes or whatever it needs. Mm -hmm. you know, so, mm -hmm. But we are not going there. <laughs> well, we, we stick with yeah. the way they want yeah. this. The reason it's so successful is nobody's changed it up. Okay, the rules were made. Sometimes they um, adjust things maybe a little bit uh, for the times mm -hmm. or something they find works. But the reason therapeutic touch is so good is because it's so pure. They don't allow you to change it, nor do we want to. It only works by it, right? Yeah. Um, so does anybody, would anybody like to get up and move around for two or three minutes? Okay. Restroom. All right. That would be fine. Go to the restroom, or I think there's water out there. And okay. So we will reintroduce ourselves. One of our, our friends wasn't here yet. And... Um, Hi, my name is Lisa Leamy. Um, I'm an RN and QTTT, QTTP, Qualified Therapeutic Touch Practitioner. And I'm Janet Dean, and I'm also an RN. Um, spent almost 25 years in hospice care, um, among other things, but primarily that. Um, and we will be starting here as um, practitioners at the Light Heart Center, beginning now. Um, we're going to build a client base, so me, Janet, is going to um, take the first clients we get and then start um, sharing as our, as our um, passion grows. Um, we're ready. So we're looking forward to seeing you or sending your friends or however that happens to work out for you. Okay. So, all right, I'm going to pass out a blue stone. Um, this is our color, Therapeutic Touch. TT Blue. Blue has a very calming vibration. Um, I'll get that to you later. Oh, here you go. Thank you. Um, and peace. Mm -hmm. So when we use that color, we use it a lot, but there's other colors too that it is just providing. So this is just something you can use as a little focus. You have about a thousand of them done by now, mm -hmm. don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I took color therapy a uh, number yeah. of years ago, and blue is like the mother energy. It's the nurturing energy. It's bringing in all those things you would think of as maybe as the blessed mother in the Catholic faith or mother energy of nurturing, patience, softness, and those kind of things. So that's the color that we bring in. We also use rose pink for healing. Um, those aren't the only two you can use, but those are primarily the ones for therapeutic touch. And um, yeah, and so what we're going to do today is I'm going to, would you be our test subject, <laughs> yes. Sandy? 
who unto herself has a very beautiful, would you like me to put it like this, Lisa? Um, yeah, whenever you okay. have to figure um, out movement. Also a therapeutic touch practitioner, absolutely wonderful. Um, and she will understand and be able to. Um, so when we start doing our sessions here, it's going to be between 50 minutes and an hour. That would involve, I, I talked to Mark a little bit about that, but that would involve um, a little intake information to find out what brought you here, maybe how much um, experience you have with energy healing, um, so you know what to expect, and obviously this group does. Um, and then the therapeutic touch um, uh, session itself, which is usually 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more. Um, so it's called therapeutic touch. A lot of what we're working with is the energy field, although if it's okay with the client, some people don't want to be touched, we do smooth the shoulders because that's the way that I can connect with Sandy. I'm touching her and I can connect with her that way. And there is other touch that we do. Um, uh, what we're doing is, have done, is sensitize, sensitize our hands to the energy so that we can feel the disruptions. And I'll talk more about that as she goes along. This is going to be, it would be done quietly, um, maybe with a little bit of um, conversation between the healer and her partner, which is just right. So Renee, what was the other thing? Uh, well, do you do the same thing like assess, is it the three reps with the animals also? With animals and babies, what we normally do is just move right into giving them the comfort, you know. So just bringing your hands over them and the intention, the compassion, of course, always, and um, doing it slowly in that way. One place we don't spend much time on, and I didn't mention while Lisa was doing the demo, is on the head. And you can't really do harm with this, but if you spend too much time on the head, uh, that can increase that feeling of being a little bit off, a little bit woozy, and it can also, um, could probably create a headache or the anxiety that we talked about. So we do a couple of passes over the head, but we don't spend a lot of time there. Even for somebody with a headache, we treat like lower on their neck. Or the headache, I, I can just mm -hmm. really do right this. Exactly. So I'm right at that connection mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. the brain and the So the small shot, the head first, and the head first and then move down? Mm -hmm. or? Mm -hmm. yeah. Top okay. to bottom, At the inside bottom. to same, outside, same. always. Okay, right yeah, always. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Uh, on the third pass, mm -hmm. if you still notice a problem in the area that you worked on in the second, mm -hmm. do you work on it yeah. some more mm -hmm. at that time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that might be a conversation you want to have with, with your, your healing partner. Let's see if they want another treatment. To talk about old patterns, some some people don't, you know, understand that if that's been there forever, it might take a little while to get it out. If it's something that you've been over the wrong way to pick something up off the floor, and you know you had you had a twinge, that might be done in one session. So that might be a conversation that we could have, mm -hmm. you know. The, yeah. the law of healing, universal laws, top down, inside out, mm -hmm. and also what's been around for a long time mm -hmm. is going to take. Um, you would know that yeah. very well. Yeah. How many to um, however many years you've been carrying something, mm -hmm. you know, around or dealing with something? It's about three. Is it about three months? I don't for know each year. I just know but it could be different for different. Yeah, yeah. but it's just going to be yeah. longer. Just mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Um, David, anything? <laughs> Did we blow your mind? <laughs> no, I. I spoke with other people at times. But, uh, okay, all right. I, I had, instead of old, is something new when my, right before my mother died last year. I, mm -hmm. um, I had just had a major heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so I had a 15 pound weight limit and she had slipped on the floor and my, you know, it's, and taking care of people for uh, since 82 until now, you know, 40 years, that um, I was in a panic and she grabbed my arm. Mm. And I've been to 
specialists and, and shots and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and the pain don't go away and one of my African friends says um, she passed on her shield and that's an everlasting pain and it was like well, I really don't want the pain. <laughs> you know, no, what? thanks. I, I probably wouldn't buy that because once you get that set in your head, yeah. this is never going to go away. Nothing will work. Right. No shots, no medicine, no therapeutic touch because you've decided it's never going away. Right. So, no, I don't plan on curve. trying to get rid of it. I plan on <laughs> yeah. pushing right. it away. Right. Yeah. But it, yeah. Uh, Bury the shield. Yeah. <laughs> Don't because I, I can feel it in different spots, you uh -huh. know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I mean, the x-rays and stuff are like, there's not much there. All they can do is maybe mm -hmm. what they would do at a medical and give you a, a, a shot for the pain. Yes. And, and it, it, it didn't work, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah. well, I don't know why it's there. So. Listen, it's, it's a... Uh... Those are questions that you mm -hmm. continue to ask mm -hmm. and try to. And now that you know about this a little bit more, maybe than when you came in, you can decide if that's associated with your mom passing. Is it part of the pain, the emotional pain? You know, we have to. Sometimes we have to figure these things out like a detective, like peel away the layers of an onion to get to what's really in the center of all of it. And um, might be something to meditate on. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. All right. Daily. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, I am going to say <laughs> okay. I published a book after all my years in hospice. I published a book in 2015 called Peaceful Passages um, about dying well. This is not a sad book. This is a happy book. It's even a funny book <coughs> in a lot of places, um, but it, it's threefold. It's the spiritual journey. It's also practical information about um, the dying process. People meet you at the door and they're like, my mom's dying, what am I going to do? This is practical information about how to get through that and what to expect. And also about, there's a lot of misconceptions about hospice itself. That people, I even had a patient that thought I was going to burn a pill one day and mm -hmm. give it to him so he could leave. And so there's a lot of people that don't call in hospice, which is the best care you can possibly get, comprehensive um, so to clear up some of those misgivings about hospice. So that is my that is my book. Is that available at Quest? It is at Quest. Yeah, they published it. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. The, the last book they society. published, right? Before the they last closed. one they closed their publishing house. So oh. mine was the last one. Yeah. So oh. come on over here. The camera's looking at you. All right. I think that's it. So thank you very much thank for coming, you. and we hope to see some of you. We will be starting here ASAP. Um, our numbers on the brochure. If you, if you miss a brochure, you can call um, Renee and and get my phone number, and we would be happy to help you if you felt so. Did you want to share anything about the session? And, and I'm, I'm not gonna like you. You were great. I didn't know if you wanted to share like how you felt or anything. You don't don't go into anything personal, but sure. How your feel felt? Or, well, I, I could respond to your. Uh, so I I appreciated um, the narration that actually helped with with the, the partnering, but just um, you know having my eyes closed, I could feel um, Lisa. I knew exactly where she was, where the energy was, and so I was being mindful to partner with the process of of what she was doing, um, and. Uh, um, there, you know, I, I'll ask you, there are a couple of points where I kind of, um, you know, I felt a little bit like this, that, that I get the sense that there was a, maybe a, a clog in the energy and that, that as that energy was, was going through, then it kind of cleared out and sort of gave me a little, a little tickle. So, um, and I've worked with actually both, uh, Lisa and Janet quite a bit and what I um, appreciate is that you know as it's a cumulative effect right that I'm learning about how to receive as and um, there's some familiarity so it, each uh, it, just the, the the treatment itself is 
there's a cumulative effect, but then the relationship with the practitioner develops and, and grows. So uh, when I'm working with Janet, she's my absolute favorite out there, Peter Touch uh, practitioner in the whole wide world. And then when I'm working with Lisa, she's my absolute favorite. <laughs> and, um, and one thing with Lisa is, you know, every time I see Lisa, um, you're here, you know, just, she's just, she's an angel. Then I, um, oh, so nice. what, what was um, really remarkable with this treatment was when you were down there twice, I opened my eyes and you're down, you're here. At one point you were leaning forward, your hair was touching me and I felt the energy from your hair. Oh, wow. And I just yeah. wanted to grab on <laughs> So it just yeah. is, so you were using your hands, but the present, and that's, um, I've experienced that with Janet, the presence is not, it's just not all in there except all the energy and the attention, the mindfulness, the lovely compassionate hearts that you both have. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, TT starts even before we connect. I mean, it starts, you know, walking in the door, you know, that's, and we're so comfortable with each other. So basically, and without, you know, I mean, there's nothing personal to say is I just um, could feel her field just needed a lot of energy, just needed a boost. So I worked on the adrenals. We always, you all, your, your adrenals will get worked on. <laughs> and worked on the adrenals. And also like the low back, a lot of things get stuck in here, right? Our hips and our low back. So this was a lot of like smoothing. And then I went on the side of her hips and you know went down and then I came around on that side and you saw when I did that too I was off pulling energy through so from the legs um, uh, I also felt a little thyroid just not a problem just needs a little more energy you know I mean, she works very hard she talks a lot in her job like hours and hours right mm -hmm. um, that, you know just a little boost and then of course the heart field we always work with the heart field too and we can't, you know, overgive beautiful compassion. So that was giving the heart field, but I did, I did front and back, like Janet described that. Um, again, solar plexus, just clearing it out. Emotional stuff, we just like to smooth it out, nothing in particular. And down her legs too, I just pulled, 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 just to feel a little bit like she felt the movement of energy, just like feeling stuck. Acupuncture is all about opening up <laughs> the meridians and all of that because we don't have the blood flow circulation. So we had just said you don't have to be medical and you don't have to know where organs and body parts are. And she mentioned the thyroid, which is fine. That makes sense to us because we're nurses. You don't need to know right. that. All you need to know is right here, I can't feel any energy mm -hmm. there. And you're going to put some in. Yeah. So that's the difference between a lay person and somebody who knows something about the body structure, the physical structure. So don't even worry about, you know, what am I feeling? If it's too little, you want to put more in. If it's too much, you want to take some out. If it's um, disorganized, you want to tell it smooth out, relax, smooth out. So, you know, that's, that's going to be your cues. Don't worry about where anything is. Do you do remote or absentee healing? Mm -hmm. Like in Reiki, we send remote and absentee. Yes, we do. Yeah. And it works beautifully, very long distance. I had a friend that was out of the country in Europe that I was sending to, and we both got the benefit of, of um, sending it and receiving it and knowing it was received um, in multiple ways. Um, but when COVID started, we had to change everything from our twice monthly practice group at the TS um to zoom which was really weird for a while but it was also really effective it's not my favorite i want to be able to be face to face with somebody i want to be able to feel their energy not just understand it or sense it it's important for me to be face to face but it can be done yes good question mm -hmm. when you send the energy does a person have to know that you're doing it well, no, they don't. Okay. Be better. The caveat to that would be, I would like to ask that person or their higher self if it's okay if I do that. I wouldn't just go ahead and send it. My mom's 94, she's in Michigan, she has dementia. Before all that, she loved therapeutic touch, and I take that as an okay. Yes. But any other person, I would, I would want them to know, I can do this for you, is that okay? 
And if they say yes, nobody's ever said no, because everybody wants help, right? Yeah, yeah, then we could do it that way. That's great. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Any more? No? Um, well, we can have time for some sessions. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure yeah, you can say okay. yeah. 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 Um, Sandy is also a practitioner. Mm -hmm. If anybody would like to have Sandy, she said. I was on the list. Yeah, time. you can do me. Well, you I, were, I know. You got yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. You told me you're first. Okay, yeah. I know. I got you. I got you back. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we have um, right outside the waiting room here, we have a water room. Over there, yeah, get some water if you have it. And then um, come and see us. We'll get set up in there. Okay? All right. It's quiet right. and it's quiet.